All right, look, I think we'll get um, underway. Thank you all so much for um, joining us today. It's so wonderful to um, have such a great turnout and taking the time to be with us. Um, we're going to be talking today about the whole school approach to respectful relationships education with um, Jared and Sarah. I'll introduce them shortly. But my name is Emma Hardley. Um, I work at DDRCV in the primary prevention team. I'm in the role of prevention of violence against women specialist with a particular focus on uh, sector capability building. I also have a background in education and respectful relationships education in particular, which is kind of handy um, because that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I would like to start today, of course, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which each of us are today. I'm joining you from the eastern suburbs of Melbourne on the land of the Wurundjeri people. And I want to acknowledge and honour Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's cultural heritage and their continuing connection to land, waters and community across Victoria and Australia. I also acknowledge the ongoing resilience, resistance and survival of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the face of racism and continuing impacts of colonisation. I pay my respect to elders, past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. I think in this uh, time of COVID-19 um, in particular, we've been thinking a lot in our team about um, the importance of remembering that nothing is ever completely virtual and that um, more than an invisible cloud is required to make events like this uh, live webinar possible. So I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations people of the different lands across the world that we are utilising today by way of digital connectivity, the servers, the storage facilities, the buildings and all of the physical facilities that are required to make this possible. So um, <clears throat> there's just a couple of housekeeping things to get through, so bear with me, and then we'll actually jump into um, intros with Sarah and Jared and then get into the questions around the whole school approach to respectful relationships. Um, we are recording the webinar today and it will be uploaded to the DBRCV, <coughs> DBRCV YouTube channel within the next week or so. Um, but don't worry, none of you are actually going to be visible and you will be unmuted um, through the duration of the webinar. Um, it's important that we acknowledge that talking about family violence, gender-based violence and um, all forms of violence against women, that it can um, and it does have an impact whether or not we have lived experience. So if you do feel impacted by the discussion today, please feel free to take a break and do whatever it is that you need um, to look after yourself, bearing in mind that you can come back and watch the recording of the a webinar at a, a later date. You can also call 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732 or visit 1800respect.org.au um, and that organisation provides specialist support to people who are impacted by sexual assault um, and or family violence. They are also able to provide secondary consult and support to people who are working in the area of family violence or sexual assault or people who might be um, no people who are affected by that violence. Um, it is so important that we seek support and that we share our personal stories and experiences of violence. Um, and it's essential that when that occurs, it's in a safe environment where you can receive the support that you need. So today in this webinar, um, it's not a safe space for personal disclosures because we uh, simply can't ensure emotional safety and provide the support that is needed when a disclosure is made. And we're going to share the 1800 respect details by the chat window now so that you can have those on hand. So our guests today, Sarah and Jared, will be taking questions from you, the audience at the end. So if you've got any questions that spring to mind during the webinar, um, please just pop them in the Q&A window that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, all uh, webinar attendees will be able to see the questions that you post. And the idea is that if somebody posts a question that you particularly like or that you would like asked, then you can upvote. Um, that question and that will help us to sort of sort through which questions um, we get to answer at the end. Um, also any disrespectful comments or questions um, obviously won't be tolerated um, and anyone who does post anything um, disrespectful or inappropriate will be removed from the webinar. All right, let's get to our 
guests. We've got uh, Sarah Tatum and Jared Beta. Sarah works at Our Watch, Our Watch and convenes the National Respectful Relationships Education Expert Group, um, through which she encourages evidence-based respectful relationships education. She also works on the Respect and Equality in Universities project. Um, Sarah has previously worked at the Department of Education and Training in the Family Violence Reform Team, implementing Royal Commission recommendations. Welcome, Sarah. And Jared, uh, Jared Beta has been working with the Department of Education and Training, or DET, or DET, as we might refer to it today, for over 12 years in both primary and secondary schools, and is currently working in the role of project lead on the statewide Respectful Relationships Initiative in the Western Melbourne area. In this role, he work, works closely with schools and community partners to implement a whole school approach to respectful relationships education. So let's hop to both of you. And um, I'm wondering if you could just give a, we'll learn um, a lot through the webinar today about the work that you're doing, but just a um, very brief overview of your engagement with respectful relationships education and in particular, the whole school approach so far. Sarah, we might start with you if that's okay. Um, so my background's in research and I first really started engaging with respectful relationships education when I started working at the Australian Institute of Family Studies and I was in the um, family law and family violence team there. So I worked on lots of projects, but one of the first projects I worked on was a review of um, family violence uh, prevention and early intervention approaches and in interventions um, in, um, across Australia. Uh, and one of the things that we found in doing that review was, of course, that um, a lot of the evidence was still, feel, was still emerging in the prevention field, but that the one area that had reasonably robust evidence was um, school-based interventions, namely respect for relationships education. Um, and even at that stage, I mean, that's not that long ago in the scheme of things, but um, it was very clear that a whole school approach was a really critical part of a successful re respect for relationships education um, approach to be run in schools. Um, and lots of people were doing lots of things even at that time. Um, and after I left AFES, I went to debt um, and I was in the, as Emma said, I was in the family violence reform team there. So um, separate from the central respect for relationships team, but we obviously work quite closely together um, implementing the whole of government reforms coming out of the Family Violence Royal Commission. Um, and yes, and, and, and as Emma said, I've now been at our watch for about a year, working on particularly around education things. So running the expert group and um, projects in universities primarily. Wonderful. Thanks, Sarah. Jared, what about you? Um, so I was teaching at, in 2015, 2016, I was teaching at one of the secondary schools that piloted the original Respect for Relationships um, material. So I think it referred to as the RACE pilot, Respect for Relationships Education in Schools. Um, and I found that experience to be a hugely positive experience. And then when the statewide rollout commenced in 2017, I was able to um, have, take one of those roles and so I've been doing respect for relationships education with schools since 2017 um, in Western Melbourne I think we have around 120 schools now that are engaged in the whole under, undertaking the whole school approach to respect for relationships I think that equates to about 140 campuses so with big schools here in Western Melbourne so sometimes we say schools sometimes we say campuses as um, a lot of schools that are you know, have over two and 3,000 students operate as separate, diff, separate schools. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing that work for four years now and um, it continues to be an exciting piece of work. Fantastic. It's a lot of schools, a lot of students, a lot of teachers, a lot of families. Absolutely. Well, Sarah, I feel I may have cut you off before you'd finished. Did you want to say anything else? No, no, no. That's okay. All right. Um, so, look, Sarah, we'll um, go back to you at this point. Um, and I'm just for everybody's um, benefit in terms of the history of the whole school approach to respectful relationships. You know, it's been around for quite a long time and obviously it's gained a lot more um, traction and visibility um, and is used now through the statewide rollout of respectful relationships education. So can you tell us a little bit about how the model has evolved um, to 
get to where we are today in terms of um, whole school approach to respectful relationships? Sure. Um, yeah, it has been around for quite a long time. And in fact, I think in the, you know, in, a, in the first instance, it was used more in relation to kind of other approaches to other forms of wellbeing concerns, such as anti-bullying um, and pregnancy prevention and a whole kind of range of things. And then it sort of slowly kind of evolved to be taken over in relation to gender-based violence. Um, so yeah, I think the first, it's been used as a kind of best practice model um, by community organisations and women's organisations who've been running Respect for Relationships education um, programs and initiatives for a really long time. In fact, I think the first time it was mentioned or sort of formalised was around in the early 90s when Deb Ollis um, and other people um, wrote a paper with the federal government Department of Education that, that um, advocated for a whole school approach. And they also provided, developed a toolkit for implementing that in schools. Um, and obviously over in that kind of intervening time, there was lots of um, community organisations, women's organisations running things at a really grassroots level, lots of teachers who were doing that work really on the ground with very limited resources um, because they really saw a need for that kind of work to be having those kind of conversations in schools. But often it was, you know, kind of one person trying to kind of advocate or external agencies coming in and delivering those kinds of approaches. Um, and so um, programs such as um, the Casa Hats program is obviously one of the better well-known ones from that time. And then sort of around um, 2007, when the um, Vic Health framework for preventing violence came out, it sort of started, there started to be a bit more momentum around kind of formalising both the evidence base um, and also the formalising the approach in kind of frameworks, various kind of frameworks, um, you know, both state and federal frameworks um, for preventing violence against women or gender-based violence. There's lots of fluidity in the terms. Um, and the other thing that probably should be said about those, that early period was that there's also a lot of movement between sexual violence prevention, respect for relationships, um, kind of programs aimed at various things, um, you know, and sex ed. So there was a lot of movement be between those kind of categories and to some degree there still is. Um, yeah, so then I think sort of around, and then obviously in 2010, um, the national plan came out um, and that sort of really formalised, that kind of acknowledged the need for RRE um, and formalised the approach, then various other kind of momentum built over that time. Um, and in 2015, the, um, the first pilot was run with Our Watch um, in Victorian schools in conjunction with um, Deakin University. Um, and that was run in around 20 schools, I think. And Jared was part of that pilot, so he can talk about that process. Um, and then that was in secondary schools. Um, and then later on, there was a, pri a primary schools pilot that occurred um, in around 10 schools in Victoria and about the same amount in Queensland. Um, but as that second pilot from that Our Watch was running rolled out, um, obviously that recommendations from the Royal Commission, the Victorian Family Violence Royal Commission um, were handed down. And so that obviously had a huge impact, particularly, you know, in Victoria. Um, so then we saw the, the, the recommendation that um, respect for relationships education be introduced in all government schools. Well, so that's a little bit of a potted history. Is that sort of give an okay overview? Absolutely, fantastic. Potted history is always really, really useful. And um, I think it highlights the importance of always remembering um, where this work has come from or any of the work that we do, because so often it is um, grounded in that um, on the ground grassroots work. Yeah. And then, um, you know, over time that gains kind of traction and then um, research funding and support and then we start to get a real kind of evidence-based um, approach to uh, the work that we're doing, in this case whole school yeah. approach. Um, Jared, just in the um, spirit of kind of snapshots and overviews, I'm actually um, wondering if you'd like to give us a quick um, rundown of basically the the way that the whole school approach sort of fits into the broader scheme of Royal Commission um, and the, you know, mandate around the curriculum. And um, I think there's still some 
uh, people who have different ideas about um, or understandings of um, what you know might be mandated, what not, might not be that sort of thing. So just from the get go, we can have an idea that would be awesome. Yeah, the, the confusion is perfectly understandable because we had a whole lot happening, a whole lot of different things happening at the one time and, and essentially sort of three things happened sim simultaneously. So um, we had the Royal Commission in 2016 and, one, and recommendation 189 out of that Royal Commission was to roll out uh, respectful relationship education into schools. And the idea of that was that government schools would be um, mandated to, to take part and that, you know, over a period of years, all government schools would join up and that the invite was sent, was given to Catholic schools and other schools to take part in the whole school approach. But at the same time that that Royal Commission recommendation was rolled out, in Victoria, we had um, a change to the curriculum whereby respectful relationships became mandated curriculum. So we had government schools and Catholic schools actually required to be doing teaching on respectful relationships education. So for a lot of schools, particularly Catholic schools, they were under the, well, they came to the conclusion of if we're actually mandated to be doing this teaching and there's an initiative rolling out that's going to provide us with a little bit of funding and professional learning and uh, a range of other support, then why wouldn't we not jump, why would we not um, jump on and take a, the, the opportunity? So you've got the Royal Commission rollout, you've got um, respectful relationships becoming mandated curriculum, um, and then also you've got um, the four R's, so referred to as the rights, resilience and respectful relationships. The four R's learning materials that were developed by a team of academics um, led by Helen Cahill at the University of Melbourne. And so those learning materials were published to support schools with respectful relationships education. So um, schools aren't mandated or required to use those learning materials, but given that they represent um, best practice and latest evidence, then um, you know most of the schools that I'm working with have certainly incorporated them as part of their respectful relationships whole school approach. Right. That's interesting to know, actually, that um, most of them have, in fact, um, and understandably decided to use those um, teaching and learning resources rather than something else. And why not? It's all there. Absolutely. Um, so that sort of, I guess, um, touches on two of the key elements of a whole school approach being a, um, the teaching and learning and, and curriculum element and also I guess a little bit around the professional um, learning strategy that is needed for um, school staff. There are of course um, other elements to the whole school approach and people um, tuning in today will have various degrees of um, knowledge and understanding of the whole school approach. So I just want to invite um, either of you really, Sarah, we might go back to you um, just to talk through a couple of the the elements of a whole school approach and Jared feel free to just sort of jump in whenever you would like to what does it look like what's involved oh um I'm hoping that everyone's had a has clicked on the link that um has been sent around to have a look at the visualization of the whole school model because that I think really helps it's very clear uh what a whole school approach is um I think as well you know it's good to always remember that um a whole school approach is it's really founded in a kind of public health approach to preventing violence which is you know is a well established um, approach to the prevention of violence against women and, or gendered violence I'll probably use those terms somewhat fluidly in this presentation um, so yeah I mean obviously with um, the prevention of violence it's it's taking it you know you're trying to um, address the gender drivers of violence against women and gendered violence um, rather than just looking you know taking a tertiary response to responding to violence that has occurred um, so in order to do that we kind of you know we need to look at the norms and the structures and the cultures that violence occurs in and that supports um, violence to occur either directly or indirectly. Um, so obviously a whole school approach sits within that kind of approach in terms of it's looking at a more ecological response to violence and the norms and ideas that support um, violence to occur within our society at a broader level rather than just at a kind of individual behaviour level, which obviously individual behaviour is important, but it's part of a much bigger kind of structure and system that we need to address in terms of reducing violence. Um, so that's the first thing I I'd say so it's really kind of really taking that approach and looking at schools as a kind of 
you know, almost like a micro community um, that operate, you know, in our communities. They're a really critical site for families and for children and young people, obviously, that are, you know, it's, it's near universal reach in terms of um, who you can talk to through those settings. It's a really kind of fairly neutral setting for not for all students, and that should, should be said, but um, for a lot of students, it's, you know, it's where they're going every day. It's, they're having lots of different conversations. So it's a really good and productive way to be having conversations about gender and respectful relationships in a relatively kind of safe space for them to be exploring those ideas. Um, and obviously the whole school approach takes the idea that, yeah, it's not just, you know, I think at times there can be kind of like a focus on curriculum and what they get, what kids, young children and young people get taught in the classroom, but it's the whole school approach really puts that focus on schools as a kind of workplace, as a community hub. Um, and so, you know, you can talk about, you know, as the sort of six elements of it show, you can kind of talk about anything from the way the play equipment's arranged through to the school uniform, you know, kind of anything and everything, if depending on what's relevant for a particular school or a particular state, um, can be kind of part of the mix to have a really interesting conversation about, um, where kind of gendered norms are kind of sort of um, consolidated and where they could be challenged in really interesting ways that might open up conversations and avenues for both students and for students and also for families and the broader community. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And I think that you've started to touch on um, some territory that I'm really keen to go into with you, Jared, and we might do that at the moment, which is you're working um, very much sort of on the ground with schools and um, school staff and community organisations partnering with schools as well. And I'm um, really keen to hear about some specific or if you've got any concrete examples of the ways that different schools in your area are, are breathing life into uh, the various elements of the whole school approach to have that kind of um, well-rounded embedding of respectful relationships in their school. Um, yeah, look, there's, I guess that one of the exciting things that we say with this is we've got 120 schools doing respectful relationships in Western Melbourne. We've got 120 different versions of what it can look like in schools. And, um, you know, that there's a lot of positives to that because the way that it gets embedded instead of forcing a structure on schools and saying this must fit for absolutely every school context, whether you've got 50 students or two and a half thousand, whether you're on one campus or three, that kind of approach just doesn't work. So the opportunity for schools to bring this alive and make it resonate for their students and their staff is a really fantastic thing. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with what Sarah was talking about before, that uh, initially there is a very strong focus on the green wedge and the idea of teaching and learning and schools are really keen to get straight into the, let's start with this. There's, there's learning materials and there's training and it's gonna be great for students and in a lot of schools, social emotional learning programs might be a little bit old and ready for a facelift and a bit of a refresher. So this resonates for schools. Um, but we sort of come at it from the point of view of, you know, if we're doing this kind of teaching, that's fantastic. But if we leave the classroom where we've had a lovely lesson about what it is to be respectful and, and what respectful friendships and relationships look like, and then we walk out into the hallway and we hear, you cry like a girl, um, don't be such a princess, man up, that's so gay. Um, all of those warm, fuzzy experiences from the last 45 minutes are out the door before the bell rings for lunch. So we really need to be coming at this from a range of different angles, hence the whole school approach. Um, so in our area, that the yellow wedge of the wheel that speaks to professional learning is, is one that we have a strong focus on. Um, we have cluster meetings between lead and partner schools that run every term, and we've been doing that. This is our fourth year of doing that now. So that ongoing relationship between schools to share what's working in schools, it works really well and, and has resonated for schools because it's an opportunity to learn in a safe environment and it's also an opportunity to share materials and not have to reinvent the wheel. In terms of that blue wedge, that idea of school culture, um, I think that's a great one for schools to do some reflection on their existing school policies. And, you know, they can approach that in a range of ways. We don't come in saying, right, all of your policies need to be updated within the next six weeks. That's a realistic time frame. It's more about as policies come up over the next few years for review, there's opportunities for school council and for staff to do a reflection on, you know, 
is the voice of gender equity, is the respectful relationships lens over these policies? Is there a way to be ensuring that respectful relationships is part of this work? Because it's a great way of embedding respectful relationships into the school culture. Um, I think the purple wedge, it's, that's, that's crucial. And we sort of refer to that if it, with schools as foundational work, that idea of we need support for staff and for students in hearing and responding to disclosures. We very much frame it with our schools of trying not to get too carried away with the teaching and learning before we've had staff in the schools undertake the professional learning around hearing a student disclosure. What does that look like? How should that sound? Um, we're conscious too that given that these conversations are happening in every classroom, that's a lot for the wellbeing team of a school to try and deal with. So we actually need to build the capacity of the teachers and the education support staff in schools to be able to hear and respond to disclosures themselves, as opposed to, oh, it sounds like you're about to say something scary. You should go see someone in wellbeing. That doesn't work with a whole school approach. We need everyone on board with that. And I think that's been strong learning for schools. The student wellbeing side of responding to disclosures, there there are pathways and processes and policies in place for school, and they have been for a really long time. And RR has just come along to maybe tweak those. But I think what's been strong learning for schools in many of our schools is the idea of the need for support for staff, um, because you know, based on the statistics of family violence, we know with 100,000 teachers in Victoria that a significant number of those are going through or have been through their own experience of family violence, and we need to support those staff. Just as a, I guess, a bit of a stat, when my, my colleague and I, Libby, Libby Hargraves, presented in our nine lead schools in wave one, we gave our first school presentation to explain what RR is. There was a staff disclosure to the principal within 24 hours of that presentation in eight of those nine schools. So it really resonated for schools are going, oh, as an employer, I have obligations to provide a safe learning environment for my staff. So that's been a key learning there too. And I think the, the pink wedge, which speaks to student voice, that's probably perhaps what I consider the most exciting part, because over the last three, four years, we've had the opportunity to work with um, hundreds, now thousands of students across Western Melbourne and hearing what they want respectful relationships. What do they think a respectful school looks like and feels like and sounds like? What is their school doing well, but what would they like to see happen further from an inclusion point of view, from an equity point of view? So there's some really exciting work coming out of schools with that now. Mm, that's fantastic. Thanks for that thorough overview, Jared. And a couple of things that stick out to me. One is um, the that thing about thinking about school culture and environment, not just from the perspective of students and what the student body kind of does or doesn't do, but the staff. And I think um, from that's something that has really kind of shifted and been um, enabled to go in a bit of a different direction with the whole school approach. Um, and the importance of setting up those um, community partnerships and the referral pathways and processes before kind of getting too far into the um, primary prevention work itself because, as you said, we know inevitably there's a spike in um, disclosures when we start talking about preventing um, violence, let alone actually then responding to it. Yep. Um, you've touched on a lot of the things that we um, what do want to talk about today, and we might go into some of them um, in a bit more detail. Um, I'm just having a quick look at my notes. Jared, you touched on, um, or you both actually touched on the some idea of existing um, school resources, structures, processes that can be used as levers, if you like, um, for getting a whole school approach off the ground. Sarah, can we come back to you around that? Do you, in the work that you've been doing, um, have you uh, seen or used, been able to use any existing um, uh, structures or systems in schools. So I'm thinking, for example, you know, like annual implementation plans and um, when they come up for review, getting the respectful relationships and whole school approach in there or um, baseline assessment tools, those sorts of things that schools might already be using. Yeah, I think um, 
obviously having worked for debt and knowing that the reporting processes for the existing port reporting processes for schools um, and how tricky they can be that that can sometimes be um, a difficult territory in terms of adding to the reporting burden of schools that are already yeah. exist, which is quite can be quite onerous so um, yeah but obviously um, yeah the schools will do that in particular ways and and I think Obviously, the conversation here is quite Victorian-centric, but, you know, across different jurisdictions as well, that will operate in different ways. I think probably one of the key things is, um, and that our watch has advocated for, is um, having it really, you know, the whole school approach obviously needs to be a holistic approach at the school level, but at a departmental level, we really, you know, it's really important um, to get these kind of systems built into the structures of the department and for them to become kind of critical part of education processes at a kind of systematic level um, and to become kind of business as usual, I guess, for departments. How different departments might do that across Australia can vary depending on what their reporting obligations are and various, you know, how the, kind of the logistics of how they run schools. And Jared might be able to talk more specifically to those kind of aspects and how that's utilised in Victoria. Um, but certainly I think, you know, um, as I said in my very first comment about that, that kind of momentum that's built, um, that's been building over the kind of, you know, last 10 to 15 years really of, of RRE becoming much more kind of like built in to kind of state and national frameworks as a really key priority and a really key plank of how we prevent violence is actually, that's probably one of the key ways to engage departments for this kind of work to become built into the structures and systems of departments to become business as usual. Well, but yeah, Jared, do you want to talk to that, the, those reporting processes in the Victorian context at all? Or? Um. Yeah, I think in t like Emma, you use the word um, levers or sort of mechanisms, tools that can be really useful for for fostering that relationship and and being able to be used. I think in I can only speak for Western Melbourne, but um, I know in a lot of other areas across the state, one of the first um, things that schools undertake when they sign up to doing the whole school approach is to do the baseline assessment, or which has also been referred to as the gender equity audit, which if you're a teacher in a school, it's a pretest. Um, let's find out what you know already and we'll build upon that and then we'll do a post-test to see what learning took place. So that whole idea of undertaking an audit, coming at it from a strengths perspective and saying, you know, we know that schools have been teaching on respect for a really long time. This is not something new. Every school has respect on its flagpole and outside its school gate. So, but what we do need to do is perhaps tweak the way we're teaching on respect because the number of people experiencing violence in our community isn't dropping, it's in fact increasing. So that conversation needs to be nuanced and here's an opportunity to do that. So I think that baseline audit is a really important tool um, because uh, from undertaking that schools can see what are we doing well, what areas perhaps is there an opportunity for improvement and now who can we link in with in order to get that opportunity to, to broaden that experience, to bring that knowledge inside our school environment. So there's opportunities there for community agencies and experts to become, you know, critical friends and be able to provide school with that expert level of knowledge that, that schools don't have but would be welcomed once they have gone through that process of going, what's next for us? You know, I think in our area straight after the audit the next thing that schools do is an action plan what do we want to achieve in the next 12 months let's be realistic here let's not write ourselves a list a to-do list of 147 things because we'll burn out in term three um, and we won't go any further so let's be realistic what's a couple of things that we want to work on is there a particular part of the whole school approach that we would like to make our focus for the next 12 months and then who can help us doing that kind of work um, I think the learning materials are another really good tool. The fact that they are publicly available, that everyone can download them, whether they be in a school or not in a school, whether they work for a community organisation, whether they're just a curious parent that wants to know what's going on at their school. All of those learning materials being publicly available is a really good tool to be able to 
interact with schools and show how the work that community organisations and experts are doing links into those learning materials so that it doesn't feel like an add-on or an isolated session or a once-off where it's more linked into work that the school is trying to embed. Um, and I also think the lead partner model is a really useful uh, tool that, that can be levered and used for uh, building and establishing relationships between community organisations and, and schools because um, that the idea of that lead partner model is that once a term, it used to be face-to-face, -face, but in the current climate, not so much, um, at, at, either face-to-face -face or online, we provide opportunities for, for schools to get together and discuss areas of that they want to have as a focus. There's a really great opportunity there for community organisations to, you know, either present their work to 10 lead schools who then have the responsibility of sharing that to partner schools or potentially 10, attend four or five events in a, in a term and in doing so actually be able to reach 120 schools, which they wouldn't have the financial or time capacity to do on a one-to-one -one individual basis. So I think that lead partner model helps spread expertise in a way that is viable when we know that um, you know, community organisations are having to do a lot with very little. There's a real opportunity for connection there. Can you just... Um just in, for those that may not be aware, you've touched on it, but just a um, brief description of the lead partner model. Yep. So um, in both, we've had two waves of respect for relationships now, wave one and wave two. And in both waves, there are schools that, are, that um, go through the process of asking to become a lead school. And then those are a number of schools are selected to be a lead school. The lead schools then have uh, more funding and the idea of that funding is that they use some of that funding to support themselves, but they also use a significant portion of that funding to support the work in partner schools, whether that be providing professional learning, uh, running lead partner cluster meetings to share experience and expertise, um, having someone designated as an RR support person that might offer opportunities for other teachers in other schools to see their lessons or go to schools and, and coach uh, teachers that are trying to implement respect for relationships in their own workplace. Um, so yeah, what that looks like is up to the individual schools, but it's the idea that the lead schools are, have been doing the work a little bit longer, uh, are considered more of an expert. They get a lot of ongoing support and guidance from the respect for relationships staff. And then there is the, uh, the obligation of them to pass on their knowledge and expertise and learning to partner schools so that hopefully partner schools can take it and run with it. And we don't have 1500 schools across the state trying to do it on their own individually. Fantastic. Thanks, Jared. Um, the, everything you've just talked about now sort of brought me um, around to thinking about the difference between schools and within schools and that, you know, some schools will do a baseline assessment and get the, the results and go, oh, my goodness, this is too much, it's too overwhelming, we don't know where to start. And some will say, wow, there's a lot to be done here. What are the next steps? Um, in your work with the um, National Expert Advisory Group, Sarah, and, you know, Jared as well, jump in. Um, are there some, um, what are some of the deterrents or the, the obstacles, I guess, that um, schools um, or schools or people within schools might be facing in implementing a whole school approach to respectful relationships? Sure. Was that for me first? Yeah, yeah. look, either way, if you would like to go first, that would be great. Um, obviously, I mean, the, ex the National Respectful Relationships Education Expert Group is sort of sits at that kind of policy level. It's got representation from all education departments from every jurisdiction across Australia and then key education stakeholders such as um, the ACARA who are in charge of the curriculum and various other kind of NGOs. Um, so it's not kind of looking at those kind of individual school level issues. I guess it's more like kind of, kind of looking at the kind of bureaucratic state level kind of issues that... Um, but, that we face. Um, I think in terms of um, schools in other states running, um, rolling out RRE, obviously it's a very, it's a really, um, it's really a bit of a mixed bag in terms of um, the resources that 
other states and jurisdictions have. So, you know, obviously in Victoria, it's, it, there's, there's been a lot of momentum in Victoria for lots of different reasons um, that we've got more of a kind of prevention workforce and sector capacity in, in terms of prevention and community organisations. Um, but then also the, the kind of really significant momentum that came out of the Royal Commission. Um, and that hasn't happened to the same degree in other states. Um, and so um, some states are doing really great work with a lot less resources. Um, and that's really great to see. And other states obviously have very different, um, and territories have very different contexts in terms of the diversity of the schools that they're working with. Um, and, you know, I mean, even in Jared's area in Western Melbourne, that's obviously really obvious, but, you know, if you're thinking about somewhere like the Northern Territory or Western Australia, you know, you've got very urbanised schools um, and then incredibly remote, tiny little schools. Um, and so how you cater, you know, even just on a logistical level of kind of meeting the needs of those schools um, to implement something like RRE is really critical. I think as well, I, you know, at the school level, I think often there's, um, there can be competing communities and student bodies can have really different wellbeing needs and some of those obviously can take priority over others at particular times and I think that can be really tricky for a school to kind of navigate in terms of um, yeah how, how to prioritize uh, particular wellbeing needs and how to meet those wellbeing needs and often um, you know with stretched resources in terms of um, you know, obviously, RRE is quite well is well resourced in Victoria, but um, you know, if there's a lot of other kind of highly complex wellbeing issues within a school community, then people will be stretched in other ways, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, do you want to add anything to that, and um, perhaps also any uh, anything that you've done or you've used to support schools to overcome um, barriers that they might be facing? Yeah, I think the point that Sarah made that different areas are, are, are ex, ex, mm -hmm. uh, and, and encounter different challenges is absolutely true. Um, you know, we as a respectful relationships workforce, we meet a few times a year to to you know network and to undertake professional learning, and you know it's always really interesting catching up with colleagues in different areas that. You know, in Western Melbourne, my biggest issue is navigating the incredible amount of roadworks that are going on on various highways and freeways in my area. Uh, my colleagues in other areas might drive six and a half hours to get from one school to another school. And when they get there, there might be two staff members. One of them is a principal who also teaches and who is also the business manager. And the issue in their area is if they're going to give professional learning and support to a school, there's no CRT within 100 kilometres to come in and replace the person that's getting the professional learning, you know. So that tyranny of distance and availability of staff are big issues in sort of rural areas. Um, in Western Melbourne, the issue for us is very much around staff turnover. Um, so we have many schools that would employ 30 or 40 new teachers every single year because they will have... In Western Melbourne, we're a very much a growth corridor here in Western Melbourne and every five minutes where a new school's popping up and it needs to be staffed and schools become principals and classroom teachers become leading teachers and there's just a, so much movement. Um, I guess to give you an indication, in the first two years of doing Respect for Relationships in Western Melbourne, we had a change of principal in 60 of our 100 schools, in 60% oh, wow. of our yeah. 100 schools. Yeah. So with each one of those schools undertaking a change of principal, that means a change of leadership, that means a change of priority, that means a change of strategic vision, and it's important, you know, there's a challenge there of trying to keep Respect for Relationships as one of the priorities. Um, I think that staff turnover is a significant issue too because from one year to the next the respect for relationships team of seven might become a team of two the following year and it's hard for them to keep momentum going. But so, you know, there's, there's ongoing challenges there. In terms of how we try and address that, I guess we try and break it down for schools in terms of what will, it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. And I'm not just talking Pantene, I'm talking social, social cultural change here. Um, what we're looking to do is change the attitudes and beliefs of young people and that takes time and that takes effort and it's okay that we approach this slowly. So when you undertake an audit or when you're looking at your action plan and you can see that there's 147 things to do, let's be realistic here and aim to do five of them this year mm. and we'll pick another five next year and we'll work at this slowly and we'll do it well 
um, and chunk it down into manageable parts so that we can feel like we're achieving success, we can celebrate our successes, we can be able to report on what we've been able to achieve um, rather than feeling like the to-do list is endless. Um, I think another important point that resonates with schools is what aligns with the work that you're already doing. Let's have a look at your annual implementation plan. Let's look at your strategic plan. What was in your last priority review or school review? And let's find a way that respectful relationships can become part of that. For a lot number of schools, the buy-in for respectful relationships was an opportunity to revamp their social emotional learning. For a number of schools, it was about, oh, we really want to get student voice, authentic student voice or student leadership and happening in our schools. And we see this as a vehicle to achieve that. So I think it's really easy because there's a whole school approach to RR yeah. to be able to find a way to make a link for a school that it resonates with what they're already doing. We don't want this as a standalone. We don't want this to be seen as an extra piece of work. We want you to see RR as a vehicle to achieve the things that you've already determined you want to get happening in your school over the next couple of years. So I think that resonates for schools. Um, I guess also just in terms of addressing that staff turnover and that constantly evolving RR teams, we in Western Melbourne, we offer our foundational training every single term, regardless of whether a school's had the training, we did the training two years ago, um, feels like they want a refresher, whatever it might be, we run our all of our training every single term and people can just opt in whenever they want. So I think there's opportunities that way to address the gaps or uh, find opportunities to, to plug the holes and support schools in areas where there may have been a bit of a fall off and, you know, they can get back up on their feet and keep going with the work. It doesn't represent a, a barrier that stops the work progressing in the school. Yeah. I think that um, something that this sort of is a nice little segue, I think, into a broader question around what, the, what a whole school approach to respect for relationships education can show other sectors and industries in terms of um, the, you know, we know it's important to be utilising whole of settings approaches to prevention of violence against women, family violence, gender-based violence. Um, and, you know, respect for relationships, um, certainly in Victoria, has a lot to offer, I think, other sectors in um doing those whole of setting approaches. And I'm interested to know from you, Sarah, if there's anything in particular that you think um, can be drawn from or taken from the respectful relationships whole of setting or school approach into other, other sectors and industries. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot that can be drawn from it. And obviously, there, there's, I think there has always been a lot of fluidity between, you know, workplace, like whole of institution or whole of workplace. Mm -hmm. and to gender equity and prevention of violence um, and the whole school approach. And that's been happening for a long time. Um, so, yeah, I think there's kind of been a lot of fluidity between those kind of practices. But certainly, um, you know, in the education settings, particularly that I work in at Our Watch, um, where... Um, in the process of developing a model of a whole of institution approach for prevention of violence in university settings. Um, and a lot of what Jared just talked about in terms of, you know, kind of doing a baseline report approach, um, you know, working from a kind of strength based approach in terms of working with what's already existing within the university sector is really relevant for implementing in whole in the university sector and, and other higher education sectors. Um, colleagues are working on a project in TAFEs as well so and that's really great to see. Um, I think you know the, the issue of kind of leadership buy-in from that kind of senior level is really critical I think no matter what kind of context you're working in whether that's a school a university uh, a workplace um, a sporting club any of that kind of stuff but you know I and obviously it has to be tailored to the particular context that you're working in. Um, and obviously that's true at individual school levels, but also when you're kind of moving between settings. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, in the university sector, that's re become really clear in terms of developing the model that we're working on. Um, because universities are, you know, in many ways, they're much more, they're much larger and they're much more complex organisations than a school, even though some schools are incredibly huge. Um, and I think, you know, leadership 
it's it, they have very clear leadership in some ways. You know, they've got a vice chancellor, and um, they can be quite hierarchical. But then at another level, um, you know, departments and individual academics can often operate quite autonomously from that kind of central yeah. leadership processes on a day to, on a kind of more day to day level. Um, and you also have a lot of kind of casualised staff um, providing a lot of the face to face teaching. Um, yeah, and obviously in the particular moment of COVID, that's had a massive impact on all of university yeah. settings, but particularly that kind of cohort of people on short term and casualised contracts. Um, and so that's, you know, a really critical thing that we're kind of having to kind of navigate in the project. Um, so, yeah, obviously um, in that context, there's a lot that you can learn from that whole school or whole of institution approach. Um, but it, it, it's a reminder that you really have to tailor it to the specifics of those kind of particular organisations or settings. Um, and the other thing, obviously, in universities is that a lot of the, the sexual and family violence and gendered violence prevention work that has been run in those settings um, <clears throat> has been student-led over the years, you know, it's really kind of been a kind of critical part of violence prevention in those settings. And so you really need to kind of engage um, with that kind of history and bring that history with you in terms of like your engagement with your stakeholders. Um, so yeah, I think definitely um, there's a lot to learn from that whole school approach in other settings. Um, and equally, you know, there's stuff that's going on in workplaces that, you know, can be translated across, particularly in relation to looking at schools as a workplace um, yeah. as part of that whole school model. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot of fluidity in terms of those practices. Yeah. Fantastic. And it's really interesting to get your um, perspective from the university's um, work that you're doing as well. Um, so we're going to sort of shortly move into audience Q&A, but I guess a uh, um, one of the last questions that I have for you is that obviously we're, both of you, is we're talking about uh, cultural change, you know, long-term, um, sustainable and lasting cultural change when doing the whole school approach. Um, and at this point, I'm wondering um, if, speaking broadly or specifically, whatever you prefer, if you've observed any beginnings of what might we might actually be able to call cultural change. Jared, um, in your experience in your area? Um, I do think we are starting to see cultural change. Like I was talking about before, it's we try and make sure that schools don't take on too much and that it's about slow cultural change. And I think we are starting to see examples of that happening, whether it be some really authentic student voice starting to take place in schools and that the Respect for Relationships initiative in schools is starting to become very student-led and student-driven and that um, it's, it's emerging and new for schools. I think that's really exciting to see what authentic voice, student voice can sound yeah. like. Um, I'd also say, you know, there's, a, there's been a real shift for schools of... Um, for schools that are starting to really embed this work now of starting to think about their own staff as opposed to, you know, as, as someone who was a teacher for 12 years myself, I can say that all of my PD and professional learning was about how I can improve my practice as a teacher, how I can be a better teacher, how I can be a better educator and what else I can do for my students. There was very little time over that 12 years that was focused on what can I do for myself? Um, you know, what can I do to improve my own well-being and my own resilience? Um, and I think a respect for relationships is putting a lens over that work around the idea that being able to look after your staff isn't an add-on, isn't an extra, it isn't something that we do if we've got time for. There's actually real benefits in doing that kind of work because that supportive school environment leads to our staff feeling safe, feeling secure, being able to become more productive and being able to have really interesting conversations and teaching and learning moments with students when the teachers themselves feel valued and cared for. So um, 
I guess the other point I'd make there too is initially with respect for relationships, the, the idea was we had student disclosure training, staff disclosure training, curriculum training, and a whole school presentation trying to explain what respect for relationships is and why it's a good thing. That was essentially the main body of work that we were expected to implement with schools over a period of time. Um, and again, in, I can only speak for Western Melbourne here, but in Western Melbourne, we've gone from those four types of PD to now offering 15 types of PD or professional learning. And the other 10 have come from schools saying, we're at this point, what can you offer us? We've got this barrier, how do we overcome it? Um, it would be really interesting if we can move further down this path of the whole school approach, what does work in that area look like? So, you know, we've got presentations around promoting staff well-being and self-care and what does resilience look like from an adult perspective so that we then feel more confident teaching it to children um, and to young people and in uh, a range of presentations addressing different elements of the whole school approach and different points, I guess, on the journey, if you like, and they have come about because schools have requested that. So I think it's really interesting to see now that schools that have been doing this work for a couple of years are saying, you know, the work is emerging because it's those schools that are driving what that work looks like. And um, as the respectful relationship staff, we have the opportunity to, to fill that gap to be creating professional learning that's going to resonate for schools because they're the ones asking for it. So I think that's perhaps the indication that the work is embedded when um, new and interesting developments and training and professional learning becomes available based on the needs of schools and not what was thought would be appropriate at the time. It's now coming from the schools themselves. I think that's perhaps a really good indication that there's runs on the board and there's real action starting to take place in, in different settings. Yeah, it's so exciting and um, so fantastic to, you know, be a number of years now in now to the um, statewide rollout and to be able to have these conversations around are we actually seeing and where are we seeing cultural change. It's really um, amazing. Um, Sarah, just one last one for you, which um, you touched on COVID-19 earlier in um, one of your responses. And I'm curious to know, and I'm thinking other people might be curious to know, um, if there is any sort of key observations you have made during this COVID time around um, respectful relationships education work. Yeah, sure. I think um, certainly we ran one of the expert group um, as a teleconference, we'd had to cancel our in-person meeting about a week out from when it was due to occur, um, which was disappointing, but that was just the reality. And it was in that crazy time when it was all still unfolding. I mean, it's all still unfolding, but you know, it was really in that kind of crux. Of the it was very unclear what was going on. Um, and the, when we brought, we kind of gave people a bit of space because obviously everyone was just too busy in the, in the, in the mix of trying to get everything up and running. Um, but when the departments did come together, um, they were obviously still running in the midst of trying to get online learning up and running and it was completely uncharted territory for everyone. But the key thing that came through was that, you know, all the departments were really aware that there was a lot of conversation going on about the increased risk of family violence and gendered violence in um, lockdown and under COVID. Um, and so being very kind of cautious and aware of wanting to support student and family wellbeing, but not wanting to increase risk um, in any kind of way. So just sort of trying to navigate that territory, which was uncharted territory for everyone. Um, yeah, but putting lots of kind of thought and energy into those processes. And that was really good to see. Um, yeah, and obviously now students are back in classrooms. So um, things are shifting again. But obviously, you know, the wellbeing needs of students coming out of this crisis are going to be even more complex one would imagine than they were before. So yeah, we really need to be providing support to students and schools to be able to support those students in their wellbeing needs on the ongoing future. Um, the other thing I did want to just add to Jared's comment about, you know, kind of cultural change is that, you know, I think at times it can seem like a really long game. Um, and I think at those times it can be really good to just remember that kind of critical point that you know we sort of started with was that we do have evidence that it 
if you if you if it's well resourced and well done done well respect for relationships education it it does actually work in terms of impacting on particularly attitudes but also behaviors um we have less evidence about behaviours, but we certainly do have enough evidence about behaviours to know that it's effective. And that evidence base is increasing all the time. So it is a long haul, but it works. And we, we kind of have the evidence base to, to support that. So it's a really good reminder of like that, you know, if people stick in for the long term and do it well, it's, it's fairly assured that it will make actual really positive cultural change. Yeah, I think that's such a good point and it is a long game and it does work. Um, that's actually reminded me of something that I was hoping to um, getting around to ask, but maybe someone in the audience is going to ask it just around the benefit of whole school approach versus, you know, doing a one-off session um, or, or doing a standalone type, um, type thing. But let's um, get into some questions that the audience have put. Um, the first one that I'm seeing coming up as uh, being a very popular one to answer is um, as an external provider of relationships and sexuality education, we are often called into schools to supplement respectful relationships programs, particularly around meeting topics seven and eight, gender and identity and how these integrate with body safety education and sexuality education. I would be keen to get the panellists' thoughts on how schools can broaden their understanding and approaches to providing respectful relationships in a holistic way that incorporates all elements of the child safety standards with specific respectful relationships um, work, including sexuality. Do either of you want to have a go at that one first? Um, I think that's a really interesting point and it's one that there's a range of different views on um, in terms of the teaching of puberty in primary schools or sexual sexuality education in secondary schools or even things of uh, the teaching of consent, uh, pornography, all of the what I would call juicy topics, which some people would love to teach and other people don't want to teach at all. Um, I think it is, you know, there's a balancing act. There are schools that are going don't want to touch it, bring in the experts, they can do a two hour session, then we can tick the box saying that's done. There are other schools going, okay, you know, there's parts of that that we can cover with respect for relationships. And then there's the opportunity to have experts coming in to deliver certain pieces of, of that material in conjunction with respect for relationships. Um, I guess what I'd be hoping for and what we encourage in Western Melbourne is in terms of that expert advice, it is absolutely essential that we try and capture the expert advice that community agencies and specialist organisations can provide, and but that it's it, we're shifting from the idea of that one-off training to for that to the idea that that training and that professional learning is part of an ongoing piece of respect for relationships work, and perhaps what that can look like might change instead of you know for the for the Short term, it might be that um, experts continue to deliver that information to students, but what we might want to hope to see in terms of a whole school approach and that long-term change is that over a period of time, those experts start working with teachers and so that over a period of time, the teachers become more comfortable to deliver that content with them. What's really important with that kind of content is that it's about who do students talk to after that content is delivered. And if that expert speaker or guest speaker or community organisation isn't seen again, students potentially don't feel comfortable going to the teacher to talk about it because it wasn't the teacher who brought up the topic. And it might be a little bit uncomfortable or overwhelming to go and speak to someone in wellbeing if you don't know who the teacher is in wellbeing. So I think if there's opportunities for team teaching, if there's opportunities for collaboration, if there's opportunities for community organisations and experts and specialists to start building the capacity of teaching staff to be able to either teach the curriculum or teach that trickier content or at least do it in collaboration with the experts and with the community organisations, I think that's what we want to see because that leaves the door open for students to feel more comfortable follow-up conversations and that's where we're starting to see that respect for relationships education is actually embedded in the school curriculum as opposed to the tick box that was done, what's next on the, in the curriculum map. 
Wonderful. And that's actually um, largely addressed that question that I didn't get to put. So thank you, Jared. Is there anything, Sarah, you'd like to add to that before we ask the next question? Um, I think I would just, yeah, reiterate that certainly in terms, like just from an evidence point of view, all the evidence in terms of that question of um, it, it's, it's much better for schools to be providing um, this content from like within the school um, and that you know long-term interventions that are built into the kind of structures of the school system obviously have much better longer-term outcomes um, and all the evidence both from Australia and internationally kind of backs that up so yeah that is kind of part of it I know that in some schools um, getting external providers to come in in some ways can be kind of like almost like an icebreaker for um, implementing RRE. And, I, you know, that kind of speaks to something that we haven't touched on much, but that kind of concern about backlash and resistance within school, the broader school community, and that can obviously be a big concern um, for schools. And often it's the concern about that rather than the reality of that. Um, it kind of can be anticipating that rather than um, what the actual reality is. But I, I also think that as a sector and schools are getting much better at responding to resistance and backlash because we've got much more of a kind of, um, we understand it much better and how, how to respond better. So I think there's much more support around that now as well. That's on. Oh, that was actually going to be the next question um, from Deb that I was going to put. So we might be able to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so we might sort of stick with you, Sarah. Um, you can probably see the question there. Oh, I've had it up, but it's just disappeared. Somebody else just popped on in there. No, I'm sorry, can you... I'm not sure which question... Um, I could literally had it right in front of me and I think other people have just been here. Um, here we go. But it was around backlash. Basically, yeah, what are some of the... Um, can you see it there, Sarah? I can see it. Do you uh, want to read it out and, and have a shot at answering it? Because I can't locate it again right now. Okay. Here we go. Can you talk about the issues of resistance and backlash that you may encounter from staff in schools that are challenged by some of the respectful relationships concepts around gender equality and equity? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'll talk about it in general terms. And then yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I guess we do know, I mean, it, it can be really overwhelming. I think, you know, and I think this happens at all levels. It happens at departmental level. It happens at policy level. It happens, you know, um, at school level. So across the board, people um, can get, it can be really overwhelming and daunting to have, to feel like you're going to have to deal with animosity and resistance and backlash about introducing kind of new ideas or ideas that challenge really kind of very fundamental concepts of identity at a, at a level, you know, really um, yeah. things that are really ingrained and deeply held. Um, but we do know, and Vic Health has done a lot of work in this area, as has have you at DVRCV, about that it's almost, a, you know, it's an inevitable part of the process. So, um, you know, we can, you kind of do need to plan for it and expect it. And it's not because you're doing something that's completely out of line or um, incorrect. It's sort of almost a part of the process of making cultural change is that you will have some resistance and backlash at some point and what form that takes can vary depending on the context. Um, so that can be anything from kind of like, you know, um, conservative media commentators at the kind of national kind of political policy level through to um, people, you know, teachers, parents at the school level. Um, so, but there are really good strategies and increasingly there's kind of like a, um, you know, I think people are getting better within the sector, within the prevention sector and the RRE sector at knowing how to kind of effectively respond to that kind of backlash and resistance that is pretty much inevitable when running this stuff. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll just kind of leave it at that. There's heaps of resources, though, for people who are dealing with resistance and backlash that we can put links to and stuff. Um, but I'm yeah. also Jared now in terms of if he's got any particular things to add to that at a more specific level. What we might do, Jared, if it's okay, is I think um, we will, there's a couple of questions here that I'm really keen to get to and we're really quickly running out of time, but I think the idea of sending, um, we'll send links around to everybody um, in, over the next week 
that have been mentioned today and others that might be really useful. And um, as Sarah said, there's lots around resistance and backlash that we can send out. Um, there's a couple here that go to, you know, questions around is there a modified um, version of whole school approach or elements of whole school approach that can be delivered to students with intellectual disability um, and how respect for relationships is delivered to, lang um, to the language schools, for example, and is it, you know, how do we ensure that it's culturally relevant? So I know that there's been, you know, a number of specialist schools um, taking up respect for relationships. And Jared, in your area, can you sort of talk to that a little bit? Yeah, we're very lucky in Western Melbourne that we've had a range of schools as lead schools. So we have primary schools, secondary schools, Catholic schools, government schools, an independent school and also a specialist school. So, you know, very fortunate in our area, which we've, we've been able to, to take in different directions. Um, and as a result, we have a number of specialist schools across the state that are opting to work in our particular area or network. Again, another one of the advantages of the Respect for Relationships initiative is that it has what they refer to as soft boundaries, which is a nice PC way of saying work with whoever you want. Um, but the idea of that being that, you know, we've had a cluster of specialist schools working together and in that space and over a period of time, um, those schools, um, particularly the lead school, Warringah Park Specialist, um, they've actually had a team of staff working and have rewritten the entire uh, Respect for Relationships curriculum from foundation through to year 12 for students with a range of additional needs. So they've shared that resource. Um, it's, they've presented at a Respect for Relationships state forum where um, my RR colleagues across the state were able to access the, those materials. So if you are a specialist school or if you are wanting to look at what alternative versions of these lessons can look like, I'd encourage you to get in touch with your local RR staff um, or myself. I'm happy to, to send that link out because the school is quite happy for that to be shared far and wide so that everyone could benefit from that because, um, you know, they have... Specialist schools understand the complexities and the challenges and barriers of going to professional learning from the Department of Education and then having to go back and tailor that and rewrite that to suit their own setting. So there's a, a range of opportunities to, that can support specialist schools in this work. I think also the second point with the specialist schools is just given the complexities of specialist schools, given the issues that teachers working in specialist schools have to deal with on a daily basis, whether it comes to the violence they themselves experience or the, you know, the issues that can play out with students who have additional needs, it's more important than ever that specialist schools have, this le have these lessons and have this education in their school. Um, so I think any barriers that we can address for specialist schools, you know, essentially in a specialist school, the social emotional learning is absolutely paramount and essentially represents 80% of their work around encouraging young people um, to be able to interact with others in safe ways. So it's really important that this work features in specialist schools and that there's no barriers for them to be able to access that. So yeah, happy to, to send links or supporting information to anyone in a specialist school if they're, if they're after extra support in that area. Fantastic. Thank you, Jared. That's all right. I think we will wrap it up there because um, we are about to, literally about to run out of time. So thank you both so much, Jared and Sarah, for joining us and for sharing your experience and insights from that, you know, policy level through to the on-the-ground um, level and experience in the work that you've been doing. It's so heartening and inspiring to connect with people like you and to hear about what you're doing um, in the space of respectful relationships and the whole school approach. Um, we will email, um, be sending out a feedback survey to um, all of the audience members. So we'd be really, really grateful if you could spend a couple of minutes just filling that out. It shouldn't take you very long at all. Um, as always, we really do rely on your feedback to help guide us um, in the development and delivery of other PIP webinars and PIP events. So that would be fantastic um, if you can uh, email to do that survey. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there will be, we'll be uploading an edited recording of this webinar to the DBRCV YouTube channel in the coming week and we'll send around a list of um, resources and links that were 
um, talked about today and others that might be useful in um, the topics that we covered. Um, and I just want to finish off um, by acknowledging that these are really unprecedented times and lonely, particularly lonely times that we find ourselves in at the moment due to COVID-19 and that DBRCB is deeply committed to providing as many opportunities as we can for us to connect as a sector and to support each other in our work to um, end violence against women. Um, so if you're not yet a PIP member, I encourage you to um, go to the PIP website and to sign up. Um, as a member and that will um, connect you with a large, large number of other people doing uh, work like you. Thank you so much everybody and take care. Um, stay warm if you're in Chile, Victoria and thanks again to Jared and Sarah. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. That's great.